The show was being run at that stage by John Harris, um, and he had a good, great team of, of people, um, in, led by, of course, um, Judy Bailey and, and John Hawksby, who were presenting it, and they had a good team of reporters. And uh, they, the challenge was actually doing a so-called regional um, uh, program five nights a week from the region being from Turangi to North Cape. Um, you know, half the population of the country, including all of Northland, Auckland, um, you know, the Bay of Plenty, Waikato, Taupo, and down to Turangi. So, it, and, and with very, very limited resources. We had one reporter in Hamilton and one of the Bay of Plenty. And um, the reporter in Hamilton was dear old Dylan Tate. Um, that had a, a much, much more substantial team there a few years earlier, but it was just down to Dylan and uh, a freelance camera crew. Uh, and I think the, the sound recordist worked in the local record shop and whenever you needed a meet had to sort of take time off from that job and go and point the microphone. But you'd ring Dylan and say, well, look, you know, what's happening in, in Waikato? And he'd say, oh, nothing. And you say, well, look, you've got more people in that region than all of Otago, and they're putting out a whole show. All I want's a minute, two minutes, anything. No, I've called the mayor, I've called the fire station, I've called the police. And a couple of days later, you'd discover that he'd be up in Auckland Airport interviewing, you know, the, the third drummer of Bay City Rollers or whatever it was, or, or some fourth division football player who'd popped into town. So uh, hard to. So we had we were sort of had to fall back on just what was happening around Auckland. So it wasn't much of a regional program, but we tried to make it lively. John Harris was producer and um, I was a, a field director. So among the presenters were Neil Roberts and Kerry Smith and, um, and Phil Gifford. Um, and it was, it was fairly interesting. And it was a great change from current affairs and what have you. And, and it was very much on the road. We'd not been previously behind a desk. So it was good fun. And, um, but it was just as challenging as, as telling a a, current, a serious current affairs program in its own way because they were very, very slight stories, quirky stories and, you know, real parish pump stuff. But so you had to sort of be a bit inventive as to how you presented them. I mean, I think the first one I had was kids on Ohopi on the wharf and they would ride their bicycles off the end of the wharf and do loop-de-loops and what have you, which, uh, and that's all the story was. So you had to shoot it about a million times from a million angles and hopefully the editor would have some half-decent music and some slow-mos in there. But that was a good relief from, from the more serious stuff I've been dealing with. It was prime time, on a, unbelievably, on a Sunday night at, uh, I think, 6.30 till 7.30. And um, again, over the couple of years I had it, Lindsay Perigo was one of the presenters and Joanna Paul was another one. Um, and it was a combination of live and pre-recorded tracks which had been recorded around the country and indeed around the world. It did a whole lot of stuff. I mean, it did politics, it did, um, you know, defence stories, it did agricultural stories, it, it had a wide-ranging brief. And it was current affairs, so it was, you know, had its, its roots deep in politics as well. So it was very interesting, very challenging trying to, um, you know, keep it on air every week for um, whatever, 40 weeks of the year, I guess, if not a bit more. And dealing with some, you know, the usual big egos and um, determined characters and very, very good journalists. It was, a very, as I say, a very strong team. Um, people behind the scenes like, um, you know, Chris Harrington and, um, uh, he, and, and he worked with um, Richard Harmon. Initially, the challenge for me as researcher, writer, uh, was to come up, uh, to interpret the official investigation document, which was in the public domain, so it wasn't hard to get, but we having got it, it was pretty hard to read for the layman, and my job was to sort of take it apart and put it back together again in the, in the sequence in which the events happened, because the official report was very much based on a much more technical um, explanation of what happened and in the writing of it it didn't seem to be written in a way that was a sort of a, a, a simple straight narrative so but meanwhile I did travel down to the South Island and met one or two of the families of um, those who had been um, killed and, and uh, met a young fellow in, in Christchurch Hospital who had been turned into a paraplegic and um, 
um, met with them and spoke with them and it was all very, very sad and upsetting and, and then went to the west coast and visited uh, Cave Creek and went in search of one or two of the characters who had been involved in its construction but they were impossible to find um, and just had to do the best we could without them. So that was my job, was to make sense of the official report and then it was handed over and, and others turned it into a, an excellent TV program. So it was very much a matter of taking James' um, book, which was based on his thesis, and, and reducing whatever it was, 25,000 words or more, 50,000 words probably, down to about 5,000 words, uh, and then building in the vision that we would be getting, the interviews that we'd be getting along the way, and um, getting that going as well, um, in that this was Belich's rewriting of Belich, um, albeit with um, Marcia Russell as a script writer, script editor, uh, that still had to go back to New Zealand On Air for another historian to see if Balich had got Balich's story right. Um, and I, I think in fairness that it, he, was, he or she was looking for the overall picture to make sure it would hopefully work for television. As each stage was ticked off. I was able then to get some more of the funding and off we went and um, shot this thing over about six weeks, consecutive weeks. So we'd go out for a week here, come back for a few days, go out for another week, come back and so on and so forth. And, and happily, it was beautiful weather. Everyone was where they said they would be when we got there. Um, and, the, and the shoot went surprisingly well. Uh, then it was a matter of getting back doing the usual process of shot listing, refining the scripts, transcribing the interviews, selecting the interview grabs, and um, finally got it signed off, finally got it to air. It was quite a long process. It was a good three years to, to get it made from start to finish. The opportunity to work on a production in-house for TVNZ, uh, it was their production. Um, they got me to produce it with a couple of directors, John uh, Kerr and Chaz Tugut and uh, Keith Quinn was to be the interviewer and, and the presenters. We broke it down into six um, subjects, if you like, and one was the All Blacks and Great Britain, the All Blacks and South Africa, the All Blacks and Australia. We did All Black Captains. We did the, um, the move from uh, amateurism to professionalism. There was humour, there was, uh, you know, pathos. Um, Always take great pride in the fact that uh, I heard uh, Kim Hill say it was Shakespearean. She was amazed because she and the TV reviewer, because you listen to all the reviews, so, um, read them all. And in and, and, and her program, she had the TV reviewer came on and, and she said, both of them said, well, look, you know, rugby's not my uh, kettle of fish, but boy, there was some good, strong storytelling in that. And, and Kim said, yes, it was Shakespearean. So, <laughs> I guess my contribution over the last two or three years is to push the documentary side of it, uh, that being my background. So um, we've managed to build up the document. I, th I think you end up telling more substantial stories and I think they are more saleable um, because you can say at 10 o'clock, at 11 o'clock, at 3 o'clock, at whatever o'clock you've got, as opposed to a sort of a, um, a telethon type approach to people just coming and going. So it's, it's, been, it's been pretty successful. This year's one, 2015, TVNZ and TV3 climbed back into Anzac Day. Um, so while we were the host broadcaster of the Dawn service here in Auckland, um, twice as many people saw it on TV3, our, our coverage, which was fine as long as people saw it. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and TVNZ did the Dawn service in Wellington, and I guess twice as many people again watch that because it's on TV1. But I doubt whether those two broadcasters will continue their interest in it beyond 2015. So hopefully the audiences will come back a bit more to Māori TV. Getting in through journalism, getting into news, getting into current affairs, getting into magazines, programmes, getting into sport uh, and getting into documentaries, it's just sort of evolved year by year by year. And, you know, 40 years on, still here. You know, you're only as good as your last story, as they say, but uh, it's, I've been blessed with good timing, and, um, but a, a very 
very determined um, drive to be in the industry and to tell stories. So, yeah, I've enjoyed it.